Sengi Ti Kuk Awa Baiki Bo Vipo. Glad you all could uh, um, come out this evening and glad to be able to uh, uh, say some stuff in addition to uh, my institution and our institution's uh, um, uh, alumni, uh, Claver and, and David. Appreciate being able to, the opportunity to speak at your uh, um, opening tonight. And uh, um, congratulations to both of you. Right? So, um, I teach, uh, uh, I have the, the privilege uh, to occasionally teach uh, Pobo history, and I'm actually teaching Pobo history at the Institute of American Indian Arts uh, this semester. Just got out of class and zipped over here. Uh, so, um, this is actually a whole section, a whole week of of what I spent uh, talking about the Pueblo Revolt and uh, what are the things that sort of led up to the revolt, where did it come from. Uh, a lot of times people focus uh, uh, exclusively on the 1680 revolt uh, without paying attention to the many revolts that led up to the revolt and also that it wasn't even the last revolt um, and uh, um, don't pay much attention to that. Uh, in addition, thinking about what are the major changes that happened as a result of the uh, uh, revolt. What, what, it was a watershed event, uh, despite being not the only revolt, but it was a major event uh, here in Pueblo country. And so those are some of the things that uh, I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, currently, um, uh, professor, as you can see, at the Institute of American Indian Arts at the, uh, uh, in the Indigenous Liberal Studies Department. I'm also a, a PhD candidate at ASU. Right now, I'm writing my dissertation, so for uh, the whole morning, that's what I was doing uh, as part of the Pueblo Doctoral Cohort, the second cohort, and so we're finishing up now. So um, if, if I cross words uh, in my brain and, and forget things to say, that's probably why. I should be just sitting here drooling a little bit out of the corner of my mouth. Uh, so if I revert to that, that's uh, my, uh, my uh, disclaimer. So, um, so to get started with, I'll talk about some of the, the events that are really uh, important to understand about um, when we're talking about the Pueblo Revolt uh, before, before the revolt, some of the things that came before that were really uh, critical um, in why this event um, occurred. Um, but on that picture, it's, it's something that I use all the time in my classes um, and in presentations because it shows all of the, uh, uh, the Pueblo communities that were inhabited at the time that the Spanish came. Um, and there's a bunch of dots, uh, villages that are no longer here today, right? We have the uh, 19 uh, Pueblo communities here in New Mexico. Um, but if you count up, and many of the dots have numbers next to them, those numbers correspond to ancestral uh, communities and communities that were full of people, that were thriving communities at the time that the Spanish invaded uh, our homelands. And, um, but there's many of those little dots on that map that have no number, no name on there. Uh, that's because based on archaeological evidence, um, know that it was full of people and thriving uh, at the time that the Spanish came, but there's no one even left today to remember the name of that village, the name of that community. Um, and if you count up all of those dots that cover the Rio Grande, the Rio Puerco, all the tributaries that feed into there, um, there's somewhere, somewhere around 100 Pueblo communities at the time that the Spanish invaded, uh, give or take a dozen or so, right? And uh, so I always like to point out that that, that huge um, difference, the huge number uh, of villages that, that comprised Pueblo country in 1540 when uh, um, uh, Coronado invaded uh, New Mexico. Also, um, all of these 100 communities divided up into uh, language, uh, um, languages that were some of them related to each other and some of them completely unrelated to each other. You have uh, Tiwa, Tewa, uh, Towa, Puro, Tom Puro, who are probably related to uh, those languages as well. Today, we, there's no more Puro or Tom Puro. None of those Pueblos have uh, people there anymore. Uh, many, many large, large uh, uh, Pueblos on the east side of Manzanos that are no longer there and nobody uh, that speaks their language any longer. Um, you have uh, um, Karis, which is still uh, very much alive today, a language isolate, a Zuni, a, a language isolate, no known languages related uh, to those languages uh, anywhere in the world. 
and Hopi, which is a, a Euro Aztecan language related to many, many other languages, right? So we have 100 communities uh, sharing uh, um, uh, many aspects of the same culture, being farmers, living in, in sedentary uh, communities, uh, working together uh, across a huge swath of, of what is today New Mexico and, and Arizona. So, um, and in 1540, um, Coronado uh, came up with a large force of uh, um, uh, not only Spanish soldiers, but um, native auxiliaries from Mexico uh, who came up, and he was looking for, as they called the Tierra Nueva, the new lands where uh, uh, they could distribute uh, uh, encomiendas to uh, um, Coronado's knights, give out land, and the rights to uh, uh, use native labor on those lands. So that was one of the uh, uh, main missions. They had just come out of Mexico where there was huge cities, tens of thousands of people. Um, uh, as far as the Spanish could tell, empires that uh, rivaled uh, uh, the Spanish Empire itself, right? And so uh, Coronado came armed with uh, stories about possible rich lands to the north. And one of the main things that uh, they were looking for was not, a lot of people are thinking they were looking for the cities of gold. They said, it's right there, it's just right up the road. <laughs> um, and I uh, don't know how they could find it. You know, a big old sign and everything. Um, but uh, that's one of the main stories that's looking for cities of gold. But also, those soldiers, those Hidalgos, those knights that came with him, they were, in essence, really looking for rich uh, estates. That they, and especially a rich estate had lots of native people on it, lots of indigenous people that they could mine for their labor. Uh, that was where the real wealth uh, uh, really sat was with the people themselves. And uh, um, of course, the Coronado came, there was a lot of uh, disappointment about um, the number of people. They, they were expecting much larger numbers of people and the, the lack of cities of gold, they didn't find this one here. And uh, um, and so through his, and of course uh, following uh, standard Spanish military uh, uh, procedure at that time, they didn't bring enough food, they didn't bring jackets, you know, they, they didn't plan to stay in a cold spot. They came up here and recognized that they didn't have enough food, they didn't have warm jackets. Um, and so when the first winter came, they probably set about to eating all the food uh, in the area, uh, taking the clothes, the very clothes off of people's backs. Uh, to uh, uh, equip themselves for the the, uh, war, the cold winter. And this caused uh, the Tiwa people uh, who lived many villages north of uh, Albuquerque to rise up against the Spanish who had just taken over an entire Pueblo community, took it over as their headquarters, um, and um, to fight against the Spanish. Really an act of survival because um, the Spanish were stripping them of the fuel uh, for their winter homes, uh, their, their clothing, their food, everything, right? And, and uh, uh, even more so, um, the, the thing that really started off was the assault of a Pueblo uh, woman uh, as well. So the Spanish were attacking every aspect of Pueblo life at that time. So you can see from the very moment that the Spanish invade this area, there's opposition. You know, and uh, people are fighting for their survival, fighting for their way of life, uh, and our ancestors were immediately challenging these new invaders uh, and challenging them against their actions, right? And a uh, um, number of, of course, Coronado uh, left this area after destroying multiple villages, uh, killing thousands of people, uh, getting lost on the plains, uh, killing his guide, um, you know, uh, went bankrupt because all, all they didn't find the riches that they were looking for, uh, left, and for a while the Spanish were uh, um, saying it's not worth it to go to the north, right? Um, and it wasn't for uh, quite a number of years uh, before um, Spanish, um, um, groups of Spanish sort of reconnaissance teams started to come up. And immediately from that time, um, with the Rodriguez Tomoscado, um, Entrada, 
they tell a story of passing a pueblo somewhere probably near uh, Albuquerque and the people that lived there pulled up all the ladders uh, and taunted them as they went by um, and they were sort of embarrassed apparently um, and so the people there knew what the Spanish were about and weren't willing to, uh, um, to allow them into their uh, homes. Uh, Antonio, Antonio de Espejo invaded in 1582 uh, set up at Santiago Pueblo um, and very similar like Coronado uh, set about to stealing people's food um, you know uh, causing all of these um, um, harms against the community and it resulted in a battle there uh, where the people were fighting against him as well so every step of the way the Spanish are coming in and different communities are battling against them uh, in 1590 when uh, uh, Castano de Sosa invades uh, New Mexico illegally under Spanish uh, uh, standards. Uh, Pecos Pueblo, he comes up the, the Pecos River, he comes to Pecos Pueblo, and sure enough, they pulled up all their ladders and they're like, you know, come at me, bro. And they're like, go ahead, make our day. We will kill all of you. you know? And de Sosa knew that he was uh, out, out man on there. So he didn't bother to uh, mess with uh, Pecos Pueblo, right? Um, and so we can see these examples uh, um, along the way. So Juan de Oñate in 1598 decides to invade uh, New Mexico and, and make it a permanent project for the Spanish, right? Um, and so his invasion is very similar like earlier invasion where there's very little logistical planning. Um, you know, uh, they didn't bring enough food, they didn't bring enough jackets. Um, much smaller group than Coronado's group, uh, but when they come up, they, they, uh, um, they decide to establish their first um, Spanish uh, um, capital uh, in New Mexico near modern-day Okeowinge, um, and they do so by ejecting an entire community out of their homes and taking it over as their own uh, homes. Most people go across the river to uh, Okeowinge. Um, and so that uh, sort of right off the bat, there is a, a total invasion of homes. Uh, not bringing enough food for their horses and cattle and sheep and all of that. Um, I remember uh, um, uh, one of my professors, uh, 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 Richard Ford, he was talking about the impact of that first winter in New Mexico when the Spanish went around with by sword and, and uh, a spear point uh, and other weapons went around and gathered, went to every pueblo and took all of their stored food. And they had said, in some of these villages, they had like four or five years of extra food stored away. They took all of the surplus food from all of these communities and fed it to their sheep and horses and cattle for the first winter. Uh, and then as spring came around and people hadn't started getting their harvests or anything like that, uh, Spanish are kind of like, Everybody's starving to death and dying. I don't know why, you know? And so it's this kind of uh, actually a catastrophic event when uh, uh, Juan de Oñate comes into New Mexico um, and brings uh, these uh, uh, friars, uh, brings uh, um, a system of colonial tribute, which is uh, um, something that the Spanish required every household in every pueblo, every uh, community that they give uh, one fanega of corn, which is about approximately uh, like a bushel of corn. Uh, one, uh, um, one manta of cotton cloth. And, and we think sometimes today we use the word manta to talk about a dress, a woman's uh, dress. But manta is really a measurement. Uh, one of my teachers uh, told me about the sitting right over there, pick on Luis over there, uh, um, that a manta is really a measurement of cloth that we have continued to use uh, that the Spanish brought as a form of tribute that each household was supposed to uh, uh, give, right? And in addition to that, uh, they had different requirements for how many tanned or an untanned uh, animal hides to give. Uh, in addition to that, they would um, gather a uh, uh, pueblo labor for different activities, right? And so one of those huge activities, there's, there it is right there, pictures of the <laughs> um, And uh, collecting native labor was something that they, the Spanish did wherever they went as part of the re repartimiento uh, system. Um, 
But coming up here, it could take different forms. In one form, uh, it would be labor that the church uh, gathered in order to build the large mission complexes uh, that the uh, uh, Franciscans uh, were devoted to constructing. The other form was to serve the colonial government. And uh, one of the things about almost all of the uh, uh, first colonial governors was that one of their major number one jobs as governor was not to be a great leader of New Mexico or anything like that, but was to make as much money as they could possibly make while they were governor, right? Um, and I like to tell my uh, students that New Mexico was like, uh, um, like uh, uh, the Siberia of Russia, you know, but for the, the Spanish government, you know, all the people who were like, they didn't want to ever see again, they're like, we'll send you to New Mexico, or you're the second son of somebody unimportant, we'll send you to New Mexico. Oh, you were a naughty priest that nobody likes? New Mexico, right? And, you know, maybe you'll get lost there and no one will find you again, you know? You won't come back to Spain, you know? We'll be relieved, right? So we weren't getting here in New Mexico the best and the brightest. Um, we can see some of these monumental uh, missionary complexes, uh, especially some of the best ones that we can see today. Uh, Jemez uh, State Monument going up the Jemez Valley, Valley past uh, uh, Jemez Pueblo. Anyway, the bug pass uh, uh, Jemez, a big old church on the side of the road. If you go to the Salinas Missions uh, uh, um, east of the Manzanos uh, um, Mountains, you can see these old uh, uh, Puro, uh, Tom Puro uh, communities uh, with uh, um, huge mission churches. Um, there is most of the mission churches that were in the Pueblos. Hey, okay, we're there. We made it. <laughs> That's what they call. <laughs> Don't touch nothing. <laughs> um, and when a, most of these big missions were actually burned down during the Pueblo Revolt, we can see uh, one of them, one of the few ones that survived the Pueblo Revolt is at Acoma Pueblo, uh, where the church uh, from before the revolt is still standing uh, to this day, right? Um, so these huge missions, the uh, walls are enormous, five, six feet thick. You can imagine the amount of labor it took to build these churches, huge, huge structures, right? And so the demands of tribute and the demands for building a church and working for the church to maintain uh, um, maintain the uh, um, missions took a lot, a big toll on communities. You can imagine how much cotton you have to grow and spin and weave to build to make a uh, cotton ma uh, manta uh, simply to give to the Spanish as tribute. And every single house in every single pueblo has to give one of those, right? Um, in addition, there's uh, the imposition of uh, um, the religion, um, and although uh, technically under the, the Spanish were very legal about lots of things, uh, technically uh, Pueblo people are not um, under the Spanish Inquisition, however the Spanish Inquisition was headquartered at different Pueblo communities. Uh, one of the early ones was at Santa Clara Pueblo, that's where the Spanish Inquisition was uh, set up. Uh, over in the Salinas area, it was uh, located for a period of time. Eventually settled down at Santo Domingo Pueblo, where the Spanish Inquisition made its sort of the Franciscan headquarters over there. Um, but this, because these, the, the missions were located directly inside each Pueblo, it set up a situation where uh, they could not, uh, um, could not escape from the demands of labor and things of like that. Each mission often requ was required to provide certain kinds of supplies to the whole missionary project here. Uh, so I remember uh, one of the documents talking about which pueblos were um, specialized in wine production. You know, so Santa Clara was one of those uh, wine producing uh, um, pueblos, and they're producing wine uh, for the Eucharist, right? Uh, for the conducting of mass, right? Um, so the, all of these demands. Uh, right off the bat led to a whole slew of revolts. Um, and they started right away when Oñate uh, invaded New Mexico and established the first colony. Um, there's uh, the fairly well-known story uh, when um, Juan de Saldivar, uh, Oñate's nephew, uh, went into Acoma Pueblo demanding food because of course they didn't bring their food with them, um, and, uh, um, and uh, assaulting people, and as a result was uh, 
uh, killed by the people of Akama, and uh, Onyate came back with a heavy uh, fist, attacked the, the village, uh, killed hundreds of people there, uh, burned the place down, uh, sentenced uh, the people, the men, uh, to have their foot cut off and, and 25 years of servitude. Uh, and, and so a very, very harsh uh, uh, punishment. Uh, but you can see that Akama Pueblo right off the bat was one of these um, pre-revolt revolts, right? People immediately were battling against the uh, um, Spanish. Uh, Picaris Pueblo, there's, and all of these are from records, from the Spanish records, uh, um, different uh, things. And Picaris Pueblo in 1621, they recorded that the priest there at the mission, that the local people at the Pueblo had beaten them with sticks and chased them off, right? Um, and uh, so he was asking for help to go and, and get the church back. Uh, Hamas in 1623, the, the same uh, uh, Pueblo that we can see uh, on the side of the road, revolted, burned the church down uh, at that time, and uh, uh, revolted, and the Spanish said the whole Hamas uh, district was an up, uprisal. Azuni, 1632, guess who got killed there? Wild guess. Priest, yes, the priest got killed over there, 1632. <laughs> Awadami in 1633, guess who they killed over there? The priest, yeah, uh, that, that, killed that dude. Um, Taos in 1639, um, there was an individual named Diego uh, Martin, um, who was actually a mestizo from the local community, um, somehow connected in with Taos Pueblo. The Pueblo revolted at Taos, guess who they killed? Priest. To the third power, they killed three of them in a row, right? Um, so uh, there's a pattern going on here. Uh, Hamas Pueblo, in, uh, between 1644 and 1647, planned a large-scale revolt, and apparently, according to Spanish records, they were allied with what they said were Apaches, uh, but in Spanish, we say Apaches, it could be just about anybody that's not the Pueblos, right? Uh, so they were allied with some uh, nomadic group that were not Pueblos, um, and they had planned a revolt. Somebody spilled the beans, so the Spanish went and collected 29 leaders and hung them all together uh, in a mass hanging as punishment, right? Um, in the early 1650s, uh, a whole group of Southern Tiwas also connected in with uh, some Karis uh, uh, Pueblos, San Felipe and Cochini, uh joined together in an alliance to to plan a, a special revolt. All of these Pueblos were joined together. Uh, again, someone spilled the beans and uh, nine of the leaders were hung. Um, and then in the 1660s, in the Salinas Pueblos, um, a very uh, influential leader from one of the Pueblos, Esteban uh, Clemente, um, had a plan, a big plan, to join all the Pueblos together uh, to revolt against the Spanish. They recognized that Spanish used horses as their main weapon for their cavalry and their hidalgos, that was a symbol of their office. They had a plan to secretly drive all the Spanish horses into the mountains and then revolt when they were on their feet, right? They couldn't fight back. Um, they did revolt, however, only they revolted by themselves, um, which is a, a sad story in itself. The other Pueblos on the, along the Rio Grande uh, decided to sort of be on the sidelines. So the Spanish, with their full weight, came down and smashed uh, uh, the uh, uh, Salinas uh, Pueblos. Um, and only a few years later, there were so few people left that the last uh, uh, inhabitants moved uh, to what is now Isleta Pueblo and eventually uh, moved down, uh, many of them moved down to uh, Isleta del Sur in uh, El Paso, right? Um, Zuni, 1672, they sent out a me message and they're like, uh, you know what happened? These Apaches came, they killed the priest. We should get after those Apaches, right? So the Apaches kill the priest. Uh, so they're getting uh, more creative maybe with how the priests met their fate, right? Accidentally tripped and fell in the shower. Uh, so uh, during the 1670s though, was a time period when uh, for many of those years, for the first 80 years, the Spanish government in the form of the governor uh, and the church were often at odds with each other. For much of that time, were at odds with each other. And they would be yelling at each other. And uh, the uh, head of the church would, um, uh, what's it called when you, you lose your revolt from heaven? Excommunicated, right? So they would excommunicate the governor because they were interfering with the missions. Uh, there's all sorts of colorful stories about 
uh, the Franciscans in Santa Fe getting the governor's chair uh, from the cathedral and tossing it out and gunfights and stuff like that, right? So the Spanish were at odds with each other. In the 1670s, though, um, a governor, um, uh, Trevino, uh, came into alignment with the church and decided to crack down on Pueblo uh, um, spiritual practices. And uh, they went through the Pueblo's burning uh, kivas and destroying items of uh, uh, religious uh, significance. And they took 47 uh, um, religious leaders all together and sentenced them all to die. Uh, they only executed three of them, but then designated the rest to be publicly flogged uh, in the plaza in Santa Fe. Uh, because they were actually worried that if they executed all of these religious leaders from all these different Pueblos, they would have a massive uprising. Um, but they did get that because one of the uh, individuals at that time in 1675 uh, was a uh, um, a spiritual leader, or what is who is probably considered to be a spiritual leader from Okeawinge, uh, Pope A, um, who was taken prisoner, was flogged. Uh, he actually fled to Taos Pueblo after that incident to sort of go into hiding. Taos was really kind of far away, uh, and so a lot of. Over the, over the years, lots of people would run off to Taos uh, if, if things were looking rough near Santa Fe, right? Um, and so at that time, he saw a different, um, for lack of a better word, different visions, uh, different things came to him uh, to instruct him about how to, revolt, how to revolt against the Spanish. And it wasn't just him, because a lot of people focus exclusively on uh, Bob A as the guy. Um, however, many, many others, some who are listed in Spanish documents, you have uh, um, Francisco El Ollita and Nicolas Onva from um, San Odifonso, and Antonio Malacate from uh, uh, Santo Domingo, uh, or perhaps uh, San Felipe, uh, Pickery's at Luis uh, Tupatu, uh, Santo Domingo Alonso Catiti, uh, Tsuki Domingo Romero, uh, in Santa Clara, uh, one of my uh, direct ancestors, Domingo Naranjo, right? So we have all of these uh, um, people in all of these pueblos. These are only the ones who are named. There are probably many more who remain uh, nameless in the historical record uh, who were uh, um, leaders as well. However, uh, Bob A gets a lot of the credit uh, and is sort of seen as the main leader uh, for perhaps initiating a grand alliance um, and uh, some people have uh, talked about how he would go uh, to the different annual feast days or different activities. And through that process of going to feast days, meeting with other leaders, coordinating the plan of action, uh, which was, of course, uh, um, memorialized here by local artists, Jason Garcia, um, that uh, the runners would go out from different pueblos uh, and they would have a uh, courage with knots tied in the courts, right? And these runners would instruct people at the various communities to each day untie one knot, and on the uh, day that you untie the last one, that would be PR day, right? Holy ball day. Uh, so at that time, um, the plan was August 12th, Santa Clara Feast Day. That was gonna be PR day, right? So, however, two of the runners got caught up, uh, uh, in San, they had run down to San Cristobal Pueblo, one of the large tunnel uh, uh, south of Santa Fe. Uh, the uh, uh, governor there, uh, or some maybe perhaps his uh, capitans, uh, decided that maybe things weren't gonna go off too well. They had just seen a few years ago what happened to the uh, Salinas uh, Pueblos. Uh, they had seen all these other revolts and seen how leaders got killed. Maybe this wasn't a good idea. So someone from San Cristobal spilled the beans, right? Uh, they sent and spilled the beans to the, the Spanish. The Spanish uh, uh, um, uh, went ahead and, and, and uh, the, the first Pueblos to find out about this uh, event was Tezuki Pueblo. So they decided, oh man, the, the beans have been spilled. Uh, we're gonna jump start it on August 10th. Uh, they decided to revolt. Um, and so usually they're credited with uh, um, starting the revolt. However, there's some indication that Pickery's Pueblo might have jump-started it the day or two days before that. So perhaps Pickery's decided, who wants to untie all these knots? We could kill the priest right now. <laughs> 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 Who's 
gonna who's gonna tell anybody? Right? Um, so pick races. I will just do it right away. The way you won't even know, which is why the Spanish didn't even know. Right? Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, of course uh, the the revolt is usually credited to Suki Pueblo killing uh, uh, the priest there. Um, and the revolt really starts off as sort of a rolling series of events uh, where uh, Pueblo after Pueblo, not all at once, it didn't really actually happen all at once. People started here, oh man, Tezuki already did it? I guess we better do it first. And then these other guys are like, oh, oh no, they're already revolting, but I didn't untie the last knot. Well, let's just do it now. And others are like, I'm not revolting until I tie the last knot, right? <laughs> so it's like every day there's more and more and more and more until the whole place is on fire, right? And uh, um, uh, the priests are getting cut down one after another. Uh, 21 friars are, uh, are killed during the process, some in, in pretty colorful ways. Uh, they're like, uh, Crucifixion, we seem to like that. That might be for you, right? Uh, so, um, and the next thing that you see all across the area is the burning of churches. So, um, kill the priest, light up the church, take the bell. The bell of the church was considered for special, uh, special care to be smashed into little tiny pieces, right? And some of these bells are extremely thick, you know, cast uh, uh, bronze bells, right? These huge metal bells. And they smashed them into little tiny chunks, right? Uh, showing the amount of, it took a lot of effort and, and energy to smash those bells up and to cast the pieces around or to uh, take them off to different places, right? Um, and so uh, through, through this major revolt, uh, the story is well known of the, the northern uh, um, Spanish, those who escaped, uh, fled to Santa Fe and holed up in Santa Fe. Mostly a whole group of combined uh, Atanos or Southern Tewas Northern Tewas, uh, eventually uh, others from the north showed up as well, surrounded the, the uh, um, Casas Reales, the, the governor's palace, and, and pinned them in there, cut off their water supply. <coughs> eventually the Spanish decided they would charge out and do battle. Um, the lieutenant, back then, La Bajada was a major problem, uh, so that it effectively divided New Mexico in half. So up here was Rio Arriba, and down there, everything south of La Bajara was Rio Abajo, right? And so the lieutenant governor would live down there by Islera, um, and the governor would live up here. And they didn't really talk to each other all that much because it was far away, you know? And so that guy took care of stuff down south, and the governor took care of stuff up here, right? Which is why we have Rio Arriba County. It's named after that uh, old time, right? Um, and so at that time, uh, they were cut off from all the Spanish down south who were hanging out at Isleta. They fought their way out. Um, and there's different stories. The Spanish were like, oh, we charged out, and it was a big battle, and we were awesome, and yeah. <laughs> we kicked a lot of butt as we retreated out of there. Um, and uh, perhaps that happened. Other versions say the Tewa uh, warriors who were blockading actually just let them go. And they said, well, you know, you want to go, go ahead then. Get out of here. We don't want you around here anyway, right? So there's different sort of uh, variations of understanding what may have happened, right? Uh, mostly we have these Spanish accounts where they were so brave. So, so brave. <laughs> uh, when they got back to Isleta, they all packed up. They, they were freaked out because they never they didn't see it coming. They were like, wow, we, we thought they were our friends. They were like homies, and then they tried to kill us. <laughs> um, so they took off to what's now known as El Paso. Um, not all of the, another common misconception is all of the Pueblos revolted, and not all the Pueblos revolted. Those who had been living in the Salinas region, who are now living at modern day Isleta and Isleta Pueblo, um, many of those people left with the Spanish. Um, it's probably likely that they were afraid that uh, people to the north might be upset that they didn't revolt, so they might as well stick with the Spanish. It's unclear why perhaps they made that decision. Or perhaps they were concerned that there's all these Spanish guys sitting at their village, and they're like, well, let's not revolt against the main headquarters here, right? So a when the Polo Revolt is one of those events that many, 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 many people have written about. Uh, there's multiple books and articles and stuff because it's a big event in terms of history, in terms of um, sort of a special event where the Spanish were thrown completely out. A European invader, a European colonist was ejected from their colony entirely. Um, 
but it's not a unique uh, moment as well because at the same exact time you have major revolts in northern Mexico all over northern New Mexico there's continuous rolling uh, revolts that are happening and and I also like to to counter that word revolt because the Spanish always use the word revolt because they viewed all the native people as uh, uh, as uh, vassals of the king of Spain you know so they said why how dare you fight against us you're committing treason against your king, you know? Um, and so they called them revolts. In many cases, we, we could use the word, perhaps revolution might be a little better, although revolution still has that revolt part in it, you know? Um, but in reality, they're, they're true full-blown blown wars against uh, a colonial invader uh, who has taken all of your food, who has uh, uh, taken your people to, has enslaved your people uh, to uh, uh, fight uh, to to collect uh, um, pinon nuts and do work and build big buildings and stuff like that, right? Um, but many of the scholars of these books uh, uh, spend a lot of time, just as the Spanish did, as soon as the Spanish were hanging down in El Paso, they're like, why did they do that? You know, they're like, uh, this is crazy. You know, we, we brought them to churches and then they killed them, us and burned them. You know, what's up with that? Uh, and so uh, um, they would send fact-finding missions up uh, almost right away, and immediately they were asking people what, what happened, you know. Um, and so all the way to this day, scholars that focus on this topic often spend a lot of time wondering why they did that, right? Uh, I don't think it's too complicated why people might revolt when you're taking your food and, and uh, causing all of these, these, these issues, right, through uh, repartimiento and stuff. Um, but generally, the, the, what people talk about today are, are different sort of topics that um, perhaps the Spanish lost uh, uh, authority because they have been living here for a while. Uh, now they had several generations of native-born New Mexicans, uh, so they had friends that were local, and the, the Pueblos no longer really respected them, and as a result, uh, they felt like it was okay to revolt. So that's one, one, one sort of uh, a way that some scholars approach that. Another one is like what I just talked about in terms of survival, that there was you know, this tribute being exacted from Pueblo people in the form of labor and goods, and uh, um, that people were really suffering under this tribute. And you can see right before uh, 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 the revolt in 1667, uh, there's a big famine that's caused by uh, locusts. 1670, another famine is recorded. Um, and so 1672, the Salinas, uh, communities are abandoned and they talk about famine being a major aspect of that. Famine usually comes about because people are hungry, right? What, what happened to their food? You know, who took the food? Uh, perhaps this is to uh, tribute and things of that nature, right? Um, and then uh, a final common theory for the cause of the polar revolt is that it was, is a form of, of religious war. Um, that that the Catholic Church and under the, the control of the Franciscans had come in very heavy-handedly. Uh, Franciscans are known um, through their, their teachings that they are supposed to convert and lead by example. That's one of the main aspects of the Franciscans, that St. Francis lead by example, you know. Um, but like I said, they were sending people over here that were maybe not the best examples of uh, uh, the faith, right? And so uh, some of these people were, were not the, the best uh, uh, people. Also, uh, um, they would whip people, publicly flog people who didn't show up to church, uh, didn't come when the bell rang. Uh, there's stories uh, uh, from a Wadavi where the priest actually covered a, a ceremonial, a Hopi man who was a ceremonial leader, uh, in a, a pitch and lit him on fire while he was still alive after flogging him. These really horrible uh, stories. So it then becomes less perhaps of a surprise why people might be fighting against the uh, uh, church. They also point to the fact that uh, Pope A has sort of been recognized as a, um, a religious leaders, leader and the many of the other leaders, uh, perhaps uh, ceremonial leaders as well, the Polori Ma. Um, and um, that the revolt, one of the, like I said, the key aspects of the revolt uh, included burning the church, destroying the bell, and killing the priest. 
you can see this is, I know it's hard for people in the back part can't see this at all, but all these dots represent all the major Spanish missions that existed uh, in, during the 1700s or were built during the 1700s. A huge mission operation that was constructed throughout that area. Um, and we can see actually though that people who had built these structures also sometimes didn't feel like burning them down. So there's a story of uh, Pecos Pueblo. They didn't want to burn their church down uh, because they built a big church at Pecos, a really big church. So a whole group of Tewas went over there and burned their church for them. Uh, it's, not, it's not clear that they agreed to that. <laughs> but we had matches. So we're like, <laughs> We put ours down, now what? We put St. Peter's down. You know? <laughs> so there's various stories about that uh, uh, opposition there. Um, uh, we know for sure that Akalapobo did not destroy their church, and that perhaps was some of the same reasons they, they, that was a lot of work that their own people had done. Hauling those big logs from uh, the mountain all the way across, huge walls and all that. Uh, nobody burned their church down. But when the Spanish came back, they found them using it as a corral. Uh, so they're like, you can't burn it down because this is a great corral. Uh, don't burn it, we can use it. Um, and so, but many of uh, the ones who seem to be uh, pyromaniacs, according to the records, especially were Tewas, who were really stoked about burning churches. Uh, and, uh, not everybody else was on board with that. Right? Um, so, um, of course, the Spanish came back, and some of some of the big debates that we have today in terms of the reenactment in Santa Fe, which has been in the newspaper and in lots of uh, debates um, in these recent uh, years, um, and especially recently, have to do with the reenactment of the reconquest or uh, reconquista, right? And so the Spanish right away, besides trying to figure out what happened, were trying to figure out how to get back. Right? And so one of these uh, missions that came up that was very important was under uh, um, Governor Gironza, who was governor of New Mexico, but he was in um, El Paso, being governor of all of this from way down there. Um, it was original Tejano. Uh, so he, uh, uh, he set up a whole group uh, up to Zia Pueblo. And Zia Pueblo at that time was not just one Pueblo, but multiple uh, Pueblos that were located uh, sort of further back from the current day uh, Pueblo. There was multiple Pueblos back then. He attacked uh, uh, one of the Zia Pueblos, whether it was that Zia Pueblo or one of the ones uh, connected with the Zia district, as they called it, and uh, uh, killed about 600 people, is what he said. Uh, in a big battle, the Spanish took uh, casualties in there, captured between 70 and 90 Zia uh, people and took them with him back to El Paso and immediately began grilling them on um, why did you revolt, you know, who, who did it, and why did they do it, and so on and so forth, right? One of these individuals uh, uh, from there was a man by the name of Bartolome, Bartolome de Ojeda. Uh, de Ojeda was probably some sort of leader at Zia Pueblo, they don't say, they say some uh, capitan, which in Spanish could mean lots of things, um, but some sort of leader, um, and that he became an ally, even though he was taken prisoner, of the Spanish, uh, and through the prisoners that they had and the ones who had also gone down with them, they were able to, when they came back under uh, this dude, um, when they came back with this guy, had a whole group of people that could translate for him that could uh, speak the official, correctly use the right protocol when they're speaking with different pueblos and things of that nature. So when uh, uh, De Vargas came back in 1692, um, it was largely, uh, this is what is celebrated in Santa Fe, the peaceful, the bloodless reconquest, right? Because uh, came, you know, coming along and so everybody gave in, stoked to see us back, right? He also found out some interesting information that a lot of people didn't like each other anymore after the Spanish left. Uh, they noticed that, uh, they recorded that the Karis people, Karis speaking villages were at war with the Tewas, maybe from burning stuff. Uh, they had relocated up to the mesas, 
and we're no longer talking. We had got unfriended, right? Um, and, uh, and so they were like, uh, this is interesting. I don't know what's going on, but people don't like each other while we're gone. They start battling with each other. Um, and that when they came into Santa Fe, uh, the uh, a whole bunch of Tanos had moved into, Southern Tewas had moved into uh, Santa Fe, into the Palace of Governors, had rebuilt the whole place, turned it into houses and um, all sorts of stuff, right? And they were living there. It was a Pueblo all over again. And um, so they came in there and they said, yeah, they, they didn't attack us. They peacefully submitted. Everything's cherry. But we're going back to El Paso. We'll come back next year, right? So that was the peaceful reconquest, right? It came up, nobody fought, everybody was chill, but people were busy fighting each other, apparently. Um, then uh, when he came back in 1693, not too many people were on board the next year, right? So that starts the bloody reconquest, right? The actual reconquest where lots of uh, uh, blood was uh, shed. And immediately, one of the most important characters at uh, the Vargas' uh, camp is the Ojeda from Zia Pueblo, who actually, uh, as, without the Ojeda probably, I'll go out on a limb and say, without the Ojeda, it probably wouldn't be a reconquest. Um, and, and one of the first examples of this, this is where the Pueblos at the time of the reconquest were located. Uh, you can see all, most of the Tano villages, I know most of you can't see, I'll just tell you. Uh, most of the Tano villages had left here, either moved into Santa Fe or living up here in the Santa Cruz Valley. So you have San Cristobal, San Lazaro, uh, Pueblos all up there in the Santa Cruz uh, uh, Valley, right? And so when the Spanish came back, got to Santa Fe right away, they're like, we're not going to uh, hang around, we're gonna battle with you. And so they battle uh, in a big bloody battle where the place is burned down and lots of people are killed. Survivors are ejected and, and sent to go live uh, in the Santa Cruz with their relatives up there. Um, and they began to uh, pacify the region. One of the first places uh, where that pacification takes place is at uh, Black Mesa or uh, Fonjo. Um, and uh, modern day, you can see it right there in the valley, visible from here also. Uh, or is it? Um, so he goes over there. There's nine different Tewa villages up on top of the mesa. And uh, um, Woody Aguilar, uh, who's from San Defonso Pueblo, is doing his research on, on the, the Pueblo Revolt community up there. Um, and so, of course, uh, he's going to be the, he already is the expert on this topic. Um, but the Spanish tried to attack them, and the Tewas straight up defeated them. They attacked multiple times and were defeated off of that mesa. Um, and so they're like, oh, that's too hard. We can't get up there. So they retreated. A group of Tewas came down and stole some of their meals as they were running away. <laughs> <laughs> um, they uh, decided, we'll go pick on Cochiti. Uh, Cochiti Pomo had been had relocated up to uh, uh, Old Cochiti, up on the Mesa toward uh, the Himis Mountains. Um, and they, they decided they're gonna attack there. The Ojeda says, no, you guys have it all backwards. The way you want to attack, you're gonna lose here too. Watch, here's the back way. I know how to get up the back way. So he goes in a pincer movement and is able to take uh, Old Cochiti and they attack it. Uh, um, and, uh, um, and it's a very uh, bloody battle where they, they fight for that. Uh, area as well. Um, and uh, Kochidi uh, is caught off guard. They execute some of the leaders um, and then they, they tell the Kochidi people, well, we'll take some of your men who are still left uh, and any uh, uh, other people who are allied with the Ojeda will go and attack Hamas because they are, aren't surrendering uh, to us either, which is where they found a Hamas people or a large group of Hamas people and also a, a group of people uh, from uh, Santo Domingo Pueblo um, up there um, and perhaps people from other villages as well. Again, they wanted to attack up this thing somehow, right? And the Ojeda was like, I know the back road, right? And so once again, leads the Spanish through the back road. They attack, uh, um, they attack the uh, 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 Astiolacua uh, through a two-pronged assault. They kill 84 people there. And there's a very famous story that's part of uh, uh, oral tradition and, and shared uh, of, of the people who jumped off of the mesa uh, to their deaths rather than submit to the Spanish. So that's the uh, people, some of the people that were up there realized 
that it was better to commit suicide by jumping off the mesa than to surrender. Right? Um, then the Spanish, after defeating the uh, Himis people up on top through his bloody bow, decide they get so they tell the Himis people, we can't figure out how to deal with these uh, uh, Tewas over there, Black Mesa. Um, so, spoiler alert, I'm a little bit uh, uh, biased. So <laughs> you can't deal with these uh, Tewas over there, they're too rough for us. Uh, so they got the Hamas people to assist them. Now they had a whole army. The Spanish say they conquered this and they conquered that. The whole army was made out of Pueblo people from other villages that they came back uh, to Black Mesa for the Redux, right? They came and attacked the Mesa again, multiple assaults, could not defeat the Tewas again. I'm like, that's right. You do that, right? Uh, and so, however, the Ojeda was like, hey guys, it's September. The crops are ready to be harvested. You might not be able to defeat them up there, but I bet if you send some people to go and destroy their fields, I bet they'll get a soft spot in their heart, right? Uh, and sure enough, as soon as the squadrons headed across to Santa Clara Pueblo and started to destroy the crops at Santa Clara and destroying the crops at Santa, Santa Difonso Pueblo, right away, uh, uh, Domingo Naranjo, Ancestor came down with a fl white flag and said, hey, 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 we'll go back to church. We'll go back to our villages. Just don't burn the corn, okay? That's how we, we, we get to burn the corn, not you. Uh, <laughs> that's our winter, the winter, the cobs were the uh, winter fuel for a lot of the pueblos at that time, right? So um, this is sort of the official end of the reconquest. Along here. Uh, with the exception that we have uh, 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 Thanos, Southern Tewas living in the Santa Cruz uh, Valley. And just to share for a second the story that's related with them because uh, a group of them ended up living at Santa Clara uh, Pueblo, so uh, closely related um, with our experiences and our stories uh, about uh, who they were and where they went, is after being ejected out of Santa Fe, moved to nearby modern day uh, Cordoba, built a whole village. Uh, the Spanish ejected them from that village and moved Spanish settlers into that village. They then, after they had built ditches and buildings, everything, they moved to a new spot, built a new village, uh, new structures. Spanish ejected them from that village as well. At this point, after two times, they were basically almost refugees uh, living at a place called Tanwane, uh, which is this hill near modern day on La Puebla, right there, and you can still see remains of uh, some of their refugee areas uh, near that hill. Um, at which point a group uh, from Hopi Pueblo, uh, from Hopi, from First Mesa, came and officially requested that uh, um, the Tewas, the tunnels there, uh, move over and help uh, the Hopi people uh, defend themselves from other groups that were attacking. But depending on who's telling the story, they're Utes or Navajos or Apaches. They're all three versions. Um, and so that uh, the people then, after being officially requested and promised that if they went there to defend, help defend Hopi, that they would be given a, a section of land over there where they could live. Um, and so for three years, the majority of people walked all the way from uh, here at San uh over to uh, Hopi. And uh, um, when they got there, um, there's different versions of the story, but uh, you hear the Hopi version versus Tewa version, they're a little bit different. So, uh, but the uh, uh, Tewa version that I've heard is uh, uh, that the Hopis didn't actually have a spot for them, that they were left down below on, on the valley below First Mesa. Um, and that uh, at that point, either uh, the Hopis actually asked for a group of Utes or Apaches or Navajos to attack them down below, or that they just actually happened to show up and attack them down below. Uh, either way, they got attacked in the valley below, uh, and uh, no offense to any Hopis here, but the, according to the Tewa story, they pulled the ladders up and left the Tewas down below and stood on top with popcorn. That part is my addition. Uh, <laughs> but because we're Tewas, Man, we stomped those guys. They took off, right? And then they put the ladders back down and they're like, yeah, you guys are legit. You can live here. Uh, and so they gave them the front part of uh, uh, First Mesa, that one part of uh, First Mesa. So that's why there's a Hopi village, or a Tewa village in Hopi is from this time in 1700, right? Um, real quickly, uh, to wind up the talk, uh, uh, 
um, one of the things to keep in mind is what happened, what were the, the results of the uh, um, Polo Revolt? Uh, certainly, this is the picture I had before at the very beginning with the 100 or so Pueblo communities when the Spanish invaded um, uh, Pueblo country. And uh, this is the other slide I told you about with all the different languages, the diversity of communities and languages that were spoken. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, before I go on, hold on one second. I wanted to say, after all that pacification happened, uh, and before the, the Tanos moved to uh, First Mesa, um, in 1696, the Tewas decided, you know what we should do? Burn churches, you know? And so once again, <laughs> united with the uh, uh, Tanos, and sparked off at San Defonso Pueblo specifically, were way stoked. Uh, lit up the church right away, uh, and all the Tewas uh, joined up. Actually, they were like, now that we revolted, and, and they did have allies, especially in the north, um, and uh, said, we'll send uh, emissaries to the Carisan Pueblos, to Acoma, uh, to Zuni, um, and we'll get them all to join in as well. Um, the one, uh, uh, there was two brothers. One of them was allied with the Spanish, and one of them was uh, one of the main planners of the revolt. And, uh, um, and so they, uh, um, they uh, uh, one brother, Lucas Naranjo, the other one is, uh, uh, I want to say Pedro. Don't quote me on that. But anyway, the one brother who was allied with the Spanish, these are Domingo Naranjo's kids as far as, uh, so relatives, right? Uh, the one uh, brother, chased down the one who was going out as an emissary and actually killed him before he got to Acoma Pueblo uh, to stop the revolt from spreading. Uh, so it was his own brother uh, who killed him and kept it from spreading out and took back uh, either his head or his body as proof to the Spanish of loyalty. Um, and so as a result was made Capitan General uh, for the Spanish auxiliaries. And, uh, um, and so this 1696 revolt is short, it's a couple of months long, the churches get burned, the priests get killed. Um, however, the Spanish, they don't have any other uh, allies, so the Spanish come down fairly hard, and the revolt is uh, ended at that time. So after 1696, there's not, uh, there are a few other occasions where there are revolts that start to, there's whispers of revolt, and people planning stuff, but nothing quite as large after that. Uh, no serious overt action with the exception of a Wadabi, uh, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, but and you can see a Wadabi, there's the Tewa village there. The Wadabi is way out on, on the, in the Hopi uh, land. So um, these are all the uh, post revolt refuge villages where people, tens of thousands of Pueblo people fled this area after the revolt period and took off to Hopi, not just Tewas, but entire villages of Tewa speakers, entire villages of Karis uh, 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 people, all went to, uh, um, to Hopi to escape the uh, Spanish. Uh, it was recorded that the entire village of Hamas went and lived with the Navajos uh, for nearly a generation, right? Uh, rather than being under the Spanish. So entire groups of people re left rather than staying around. Um, also, uh, different villages uh, reduced, uh, that were now shrunk so small in size, they joined up with other communities rather than continuing on uh, as their own village. One example of that is uh, Ujemuke, uh, just over here by Buffalo Thunder, uh, where after the revolt, that village had shrunk to such a small size, the last uh, uh, remnants of the people uh, moved uh, to Tsuki and to here and to San uh, uh, Difanso, uh, Hunkane, uh, Hakona Pueblo. Uh, they moved, apparently, as far as can tell, moved to San Difanso Pueblo. Um, and one they moved over to uh, um, Hopi Tewa, but some of them moved uh, to Santa Clara instead of going all the way. Uh, Fioke Oinge, north of Oke Oinge, uh, they left to join the Tewas in, in First Mesa. So you have all this movement of people uh, to, to the Hopi Mesas, uh, some of which would return back. And so one of the interesting notes, are there any Mokinos in here? Mokinos? No Mokinos. If you had that last name, those were people who, in the generations after the Pueblo Revolt, actually returned back to New Mexico 
uh, from Hopi. So the Spanish gave them the last name Mokino. Uh, Moki is how the Spanish called people from Hopi, so it, it means someone from Hopi. Uh, but it may have mean somebody that's a, a Carissa person that had been living over there and moved back. So they gave that name as part of the returners back to this area. Um, but some of uh, the, uh, um, the sort of end of the, the revolt, I always like this uh, mural, uh, Michael Cabote, uh, showing the destruction of a watery, whereas part of this, 1701, um, in Hopi, the Spanish mission in the village of Awadavi, uh, the Hopi villages joined together, uh, decided they needed to, in order to get rid of the Spanish, they had to eradicate the entire village. So they actually attacked one of their own villages and completely destroyed the place, killed the priest, as you can see here, he's uh, getting killed, and uh, uh, destroyed the church and everything like that. As, uh, and the Spanish never did go back uh, and establish a mission in Hopi, uh, which was a uh, revolt where they actually permanently ejected the Spanish uh, there, right? Um, just to give you some, some facts here, some figures. Um, all right, so at the time that the Spanish invaded, 1598, there was maybe about 100,000 people or more living in 100 villages in New Mexico, 100,000. That means now, Pueblo communities, we've just barely caught up uh, with our population at the time that the Spanish came, right? So, um, but in many more villages than there are today. Um, by 1679, this is 80 years after the Spanish had, had invaded, there was only 46 villages left. So almost half of them had been, had gone away with only about 18,000 people living in those 46 uh, uh, villages. So we have about 80% of all the people are gone and half of all the villages are gone in the year before the revolt. Um, at the end of the revolt, after a after all the 1680 revolt, 1696 revolt, after the bloody reconquest, um, the Spanish count 18 pueblos, one less than today. After the, in 1706, there's only 18 pueblos. And they counted in their, uh, uh, in their survey, their census, 6,440 people left. So now we're talking about 108 years of Spanish uh, colonial efforts. The population have been de declined by 94% and 82% uh, uh, of the uh, uh, villages are destroyed during that time, right? So the revolt um, itself, you can see in just the years of the revolt, the Pueblos lost uh, almost half the number of Pueblos that were here during that uh, tumultuous period. So even though Pueblo people had ejected the Spanish, it was also a disaster for all of us as well. The whole event, the reconquest, the battles that happened afterward, um, and, and uh, even all the people who decided, uh, the entire big town, the entire uh, village of Pickerys left to go live with uh, Apaches, uh, you know, rather than, than stay in this area. So people are leaving left and right, right? And so um, some of the things to think about in terms of uh, this is, uh, what does it mean uh, to commemorate this event? I know that it's uh, popular in, in recent years uh, to really commemorate the event, um, but to also remember that difficult part of it, uh, that it was a time of incredible turmoil uh, within Pueblo country itself as well. And so that sometimes people did not uh, um, treat each other uh, as the way that we would like to be treated, as the way that people were instructed from the beginning of time to treat one another. Um, and so, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, colleagues from uh, Akuma Pueblo, uh, he said, you know, we don't really have any stories about the Pueblo Revolt. In fact, it's as if, in our old tradition, the Pueblo Revolt did not even happen. And on the DL, I've heard that from many other Pueblo people as well, that we have stories about all sorts of things about the past. Times when Spanish sheep got into Santa Clara Canyon and we had a big old problem with those guys living up by Hernandez, right? Uh, times when people were stealing our ditch water over by Huachupangi. Uh, all of these stuff that I was saying, eh, it's sort of a big deal, but not that big of a deal, right? And then 
you like polo revolve would be like a really big deal, and then there's like crickets, right? You say, well, what? What's the deal with that? What's up with that? You know? And I remember something that Mike Cavoti said in painting this picture um, in this interview and talking about. He said, "Look at the face of the priest, and look at the face of the, those who are attacking him and killing him. They're the same color. They're grayed out. That they have become painted by the actions of the revolt. That." When we become like our enemies, when we behave as they do, when we kill with abandon, we have forgotten what is so important about what makes us Polo people. And as a result, it's something to remember in terms of how we should not act, how we should not treat others. The way that, uh, as my great grandma used to say, in Dao Din Pui, not in Gim Pui, you know, it'll come back on them how they act. It's up to us to act the way uh, that we're supposed to act, to be the people we're supposed to be from the beginning of time when we got the instructions we're supposed to have uh, how to be human beings, right? And so that this serves as a lesson uh, in many ways. And so to be thoughtful about the way to commemorate it, uh, be thoughtful about thinking what does it mean for us today as Pueblo people in 2018 as we lay the road uh, for future generations. Uh, how is it that we want to remember the past and instruct those that come uh, in front of us uh, in, in how to be human beings and how uh, we can again thrive as Polo people uh, just as our population has come back again. So with that, thank you all very much for allowing me to come and speak to you um, and um, hope you have a great rest of your evening. I'll stick around for questions. The missing polo is uh, Sandia Polo. It's not reestablished until uh, 1740s, if I recall correctly. Don't quote me on that, but I think somewhere in here that sounds right. Uh, and and uh, uh, Sandia Polo was reestablished by people coming back from Hopi. Uh, any other questions? Because they were so strong in their belief in, in their public beliefs, traditions, dances, songs, and what have you. If it wasn't for them, because many of them went away from the village to do their traditional things, away in the, in the mesas and, and did it at night and stuff, away from the Spanish tyranny. Because of them, Many of our dances, songs, and traditions we still have today, and I thank them for that. Because if it wasn't for them, we won't have what we have today. And children, young kids, we always, and all the puzzles are dealing with us, the same thing. Teach your language to your kids. Because we don't know, because two, three generations from now, our the kids may not even uh, learn or talk Tewa, Keras, Zuni. They'll lose it. We're losing it because of the cell phones, computers, that. Those are important elements of why <coughs> our, our own people in the public, when we have dances, tell the kids that people, when we have dances, turn off your computers, your cell phones. I would, and, and I would, I'm, my grandpa is from Hopi Tewa from Mount uh, Palaka. We go out and dance and participate there too. We had our um, rain dance last August, and I was there participating. And the, the, the leader went up on top of the Kiva and told all the people, turn off your cell phones. No Facebook. Don't put these on, on the Facebook to tell the world that's happening. Kids 
and our own people are doing it in the Philippines. But I thank my ancestors, my own great great grandfather, grandmothers, for keeping the faith, for being humble people, no matter what happened to them. Because their tradition and the language were so strong that they stuck with that. So remember all <coughs> humble people. These are kind of, these are very important times for us. Because you know, I don't want to see down the road, I may not be here, but you know, for the next generation. I hope and pray that our next generation to come, that they speak table, care for others, that they continue those traditions. That's important. Good night. Uh, it's um, it's part of the uh, um, okay. If you're driving to Bernalillo and then you turn left, like you're going to Rio Rancho, um, it's actually the high the road, the main road. I can't remember what it's called. It goes through the pueblo basically, and about half the village is in the right of way between the highway and the housing developments that have popped up. And there's not really any. I I've, I've been there. There's not much to see uh, there, unfortunately. Um, and so uh, that's a, uh, uh, that's, there. I think there's a sign there. And that's about all there is to see. Mm -hmm. huh? You mentioned um, when the Vargas came into Santa Fe, that the Perez and the Tehuahua were getting along. Um, but I also grew up with the colonial narrative, which um, speaks to that the Navajos and Apaches, ubiquitous Apaches, um, had started attacking the Pueblo communities who, without Spanish protection, were vulnerable. And you didn't mention that, so could you comment on whether that colonial narrative is just completely invented or if there's any truth to it? Um. Yes and no, probably, is the answer, you know, there's uh, certainly um, some um, nomadic groups or semi-nomadic groups of uh, uh, youths, uh, Hickory Apaches, who had long-term relationships, you know, um, and of course, like uh, I said, the entire pueblo of Hamas moved in with uh, uh, Navajos in the Obanador Largo district for uh, quite a long time, right, before they came back to uh, modern-day Hamas Pueblo. Um, and so um, the Spanish certainly didn't like when people came and took sheep or things like that. Um, but the other part of the story is uh, that's uh, uh, very important that I spent a lot of time when I'm teaching a history class is that Pueblo Rebol unleashed horses in a lot of ways on North America. Um, when the churches got lit up and the estancias were lit up, they opened the corrals, right? And all of these uh, um, broken horses ran out. And right away in the record, you can see everybody scoring horses like all in the whole area. And they're like, this is way fun, right? <laughs> like, I can do things faster, <laughs> you know, that do things I didn't think about doing before, maybe. Or I wouldn't do it if I was, didn't have a horse, right? So, uh, um, and probably the most famous example of that is uh, Comanches. Um, and of course, uh, first record is not long after Pueblo Revolt. I believe the first re record of Comanches is 1704. Um, a group of Udo Aztecan speaking people showing out of nowhere with horses um, on the plains. Um, and prom promptly kind of scaring everybody around the whole area. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of battle that happens about that. And it's pretty clear that Comanches would would raid one year and come and trade the next year. So it's kind of like, uh, like, okay, we were gonna give you something for stuff this time. Next year we might just want stuff five finger discount, right? Um, and so there was that back and forth going on, but they did uh, uh, cause serious concerns uh, uh, on uh, on the south east side 
where the Pobo Galisteo eventually had to become abandoned because of Comanches in the later part of the 1700s, and they moved the last remnants, even though they were Tewas, moved to uh, uh, Santo Domingo Pueblo, um, and then Pecos Pueblo, of course, had shrunk so small in size, of course they left later, but a lot of that shrinking is, is often told in terms of Comanche raids that really um, diminish that Pueblo. Um, and so Comanches appear to, in the record, at least be a pretty serious problem to everybody. And right away you can see that after the revolt, uh, all the Pueblo communities for the most part joined in alliance with the Spanish to battle some of these groups, right? So uh, um, the captain, captain general of the auxiliaries, uh, first from Santa Clara Pueblo uh, in the early part, um, they were, one of their big missions were sort of joined up. Most of the Spanish army was made out of Pueblo people. So any kind of Spanish victory is really actually a Pueblo, Pueblo uh, uh, won events, right? Spanish would probably not find their enemies. Uh, when they did stuff on their own, they usually got lost, you know. Um, <laughs> they bring food, you know, things like that, you know. So uh, uh, without Pueblo auxiliaries, they're not going to, uh, um, they were not going to be successful. And that led to one of the more famous battles up near modern day uh, um, Pueblo, Colorado, where one of the major uh, Comanche leaders was defeated uh, by the name of Cuerno Verde. Um, and so um, the large force of Pueblo auxiliaries, but really the Spanish army, which was Pueblo people, defeated uh, a very scary group of Comanches, right? Everybody was like, we never beat Comanches ever before. They went up there and they beat Comanches and they celebrated all the way back, right? Uh, my understanding is they took that horn from Greenhorn, it was a green horn, buffalo horn painted green, and they were so stoked about the first time they beat Comanches, they're like, we gotta send this somewhere cool to show like we actually could beat Comanches. It's a possibility that that could happen, right? Uh, so they shipped it. Apparently, it's somewhere in the archives in the Vatican. That's what they sent it. <laughs> I don't know where it's over there. They're like the Pope should check this out. You know? I'm sure he'll really appreciate that Comanches are not actually invincible. We're pretty sure they were invincible, and then now we have a green horn. The Pope should know about it. <laughs> so, but those are a whole group of uh, Polo people that were participants in that. So, there's that narrative as well where Polo communities and Spanish communities actually linked up in a lot of cases uh, for those purposes. Right? So, I think. The answer is it's complicated, you know, um, and I, but I don't really think that the that at the time the polos were still uh, um, fairly strong, uh, right at that time. But that through all of that violence, you can see the numbers decline really dramatically. Right? So, question. Right there. I'm from a place called Santiago, and there's a couple of ruins. Uh, do you know who the next? San Miguel. Remind me where that's at again. Um, more, you know where Tierra State Park is. Um, as you're going to the little cities, you'll see even the cities in Pueblo. And on top of the hill there, there's right here, there's the fort, um, story building there. And there's pottery everywhere. There's food up behind the wall. Um, nothing for there. And when I checked my ancestry, um, we run into walls because we know this bit of pieces, we don't know where we're going. There, well, there's a, a lot of, uh, this is a story for another day, because um, uh, I'll go down that rabbit hole. But, uh, the, the story of Inisagos, right, in New Mexico, uh, the people were, Scott, they rescued Indians, right, uh, and that designated to live in certain uh, uh, towns. Um, there's a big part of the story of New Mexico, really, is the story of Inisagos. And so that's something to, to, to keep in mind as well. But also a lot of uh, Hinisaro villages were also located at or near uh, ancestral Pueblo villages and included inhabitants from those uh, villages. Probably a very, very famous uh, example of that is Abiquiu, uh, a designated Hinisaro um, community that was established on a te ancestral Tewa village. Uh, there's some of the records say call it like Moki village, because a whole group of, I believe, 40 uh, people from Hopi moved back there uh, and settled there because they used to live there uh, or lived near there or were designated. 
So those are some of the stories about people living where uh, their ancestors still remembered where they used to live. You know, so. Well, because on, on our record, it says Navajo or Indian servants. Mm. Oh, Indian servants? That's classic Inisaro document right there. That's most likely... Say, okay, I'll go down the rabbit hole. Uh, so, so uh, under the, under the law, laws of the Indies, right, uh, it was illegal. Slavery was illegal, right? But there's always loopholes. It's like the tax code, right? Uh, so it was uh, uh, like for the corporations, right? They found out that if, so other tribes, uh, and uh, Comanches a lot of times would come to Pecos or, uh, um, or uh, Taos Pueblo, um, and they would bring people that they had taken captive. They were Pawnees or Navajos or Apaches or whatever the case might be, right? Um, and they would bring them there, but you couldn't buy them to be slaves, right? So what you would do is you would pay for those people, and they were called rescate or rescued. Right? So you rescued them from their captors. However, it cost you a lot to rescue them, right? And then you take them to the church and baptize them, give them your last name. Um, and now they owe you even more, right? Um, and they're like, well, you can work this off by staying at my house and work all this off because we rescued you. Congratulations, you're welcome, right? And at that point, it would take 10 or 20 years to work off your rescue. Once you become done with your rescue, you become reclassified as what's known as inisaro, right? And so in the records, a lot of times they list servant. They were a servant because they were working off their rescue, right? And after they became an inisaro, they had to live in only certain villages, like Abiquiu, um, Placitas, Belen, um, Rancho de Taos, O Cayente, right? Those are all designated only for inisaros, right? And so we're talking about when you see that in the record, you're most likely found somebody who had been taken prisoner, had been rescued, had been put into indentured servitude to pay off their rescue, and then got reclassified later on. Now, over several generations, you can see in the record that somebody that was a Inisoro, basically a Inisoro could be like a, a Navajo or Apache person taken as a kid and raised up as a servant they get reclassified, they marry a mestizo, then their kids are mestizos, the mestizo marries the espanol, and then the next generation, puro espanol, so you have these people who are like, I'm pure Spanish, right? <laughs> my, last, my last name uh, uh, comes from this uh, castle in Spain, and this is my coat of arms, and big old cool story, right? And then in reality, their ancestor was a, a rescued person, who happened to be rescued by uh, uh, someone with that last name, right? So a lot of those surnames have that quality. If you look into those records, if you see that, that's you actually have a pretty good understanding of what happened there. I want to dig more that, that's a, that's a, yeah. Those, sometimes those records are, those are hard to find where, yeah. where people are taken captive and how they were taken captive, who took them. Because the Spanish would also go uh, and attack Navajo or Apache rancherias or uh, settlements and rescue people physically, right? You know, uh, like you were living uh, in barbarism, so we rescued you from that, right? Mm -hmm. Along with some sheep uh, or <laughs> whatever, you know. Uh, so there's different ways you could get rescued. And so it's interesting, though. No. Mm. Oh. So I think I still kind of find more information. I bet you. Okay. <laughs> oh, I know that place. Okay, I I was going to picture where that is. That because. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I know where that is. That's and there's a um, so. So when Pickery's whole Pueblo moved and lived with Apaches out on the, the Plains, Plains Apaches, for a period of time, um, the colonial story, the narrative says, they sent somebody back and they're like, actually, we don't like living with Apaches. Uh, could you send somebody to rescue us, right? Um, and so as a whole group of Spanish and Pueblo auxiliaries went out there and rescued them uh, and brought them back to Pickery's Pueblo and resettled Pickery's Pueblo. 
but um, there was very few people that came back. So a lot of people either didn't come back. They also captured a bunch of people and fought, and they're like, we had the battle, and you know, it's a whole other story that's involved with that. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's the story. It comes from that moment in time after the Pueblo Revolt, where they took somebody that they labeled an Apache, uh, indentured them through servitude, and then eventually resettled them. You know? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, talking to some of the people of Anisidos and Abiquiu, that a lot of their story was that uh, they were descendants of the children who were in the way, from the Pueblo women and the Anisidos. And so, they recognized them as you know, their children. And so they were somewhat sad, uh, safe mm -hmm. by letting them stay in the villages. Yeah, that's a big. Uh, um, what uh, Cole Marion was saying was uh, uh, that some of the stories passed down is. Um, the, some of the Inisaros or how they become into servitude is uh, because they were children of rape. Um, whether they was through rape of a, a Pueblo woman or rape of someone who had taken already as a, a servant um, or uh, um, through some other processes like that. Uh, there's pretty common records of um, the servants who were rescued, especially females were the most valuable. They would pay much, much more for female servants. Uh, boys are not worth uh, a whole lot, especially female children. When they would start growing and, and come into adolescence, a lot of times, all of a sudden they became pregnant, you know? And then they have to resolve, like, why we have to fix this problem, you know? How did that happen, sort of thing, you know? So a lot of times it comes from those events as well. I know uh, to quote uh, Virgil uh, Trujillo from Abiquiu Pueblo Hill, I remember it very poignantly saying that in Isaros, one, one uh, definition is children of war, you know? Um, because of the violence related with that. And I think it's kind of, it kind of hits at my heart, you know, to think about those people who are just taken away from their families, you know. And these are the descendant communities who are children of that, of war, you know. And, and maybe it's children of war and rape, you know. Um, and it's a big part of the story here. So that's important. Any other, one more question? Or? Yeah. <laughs> you from Abiquiu? Oh. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. <laughs> I'm writing a dissertation, but maybe after I finish that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've always wondered about um, how long did it take the people, the, the Native people, to organize the revolt? How long did it take them? So, uh, question, how long did it take to organize the revolt? Well, both A and all those 47 other leaders were taken captive and flogged in Santa Fe, in the plaza, in 1675. Their actual revolt takes place in 1680. So we're looking at about five years. You know, he's in prison there for a while with other leaders before he's released and then takes off to a house to sort of seek refuge in a sense. Well, we're looking at potentially five years of planning, um, maybe less. Uh, maybe, maybe in fact, they were taken prisoner because they were already planning it, and someone spilled the beans on them, right? And so that's why they're taken. So maybe the plan was already in operation at the time, and they just went back into planning, you know, and took another five years to carefully lay all the groundwork. Um, so. San Marcos Pueblo uh, because it was right there in between the north and south you know 
um, that they were holding those meetings and figuring out. They had to they had to be pretty secretive to to move around. Uh, one of the things that are uh, fortunate about that I think was important part of the success of the revolt too is they have these Franciscan priests and all these villages who are there in the village who are kind of like Spanish spies everywhere, right? However, uh, because of Spanish policy, they would move people around all the time. So in the entire first 80 years the Spanish were here, no, um, uh, only one priest in that whole time, one priest learned the language of the place that they were stationed. Out of all the priests in all the villages, none of them actually learned the language of the place that they were at, right? Um, so, which goes back to uh, uh, how they were able to maintain what uh, uh, Matt Man Gary was saying about uh, how our ancestors were able to hold on to our traditions so that we could have what we have today. Um, a lot of it, too, is that the Spanish, uh, um, they were able to do that because the Spanish had no clue what was going on a lot of times. You know, they couldn't speak the language, they didn't have anybody. Uh, the, the ones who would spill the beans were Pueblo people themselves who would go and, and, and spill the beans. But the Spanish were most of the time pretty clueless about what was going on. Even the priests, you can imagine, you have to go to Mass every Sunday, right? You go there, and there's some guy out there, and he, if you don't go, you get whipped, right? But if you go, then they say a bunch of stuff in Latin, they sing songs in Latin, and then when they go to their homily, they're speaking uh, uh, Spanish, right? And they have no clue what's going on. Well, we, you would stand there Sunday after Sunday and days of obligation, no idea what's going on. But if you don't show up, you get whipped, right? Uh, and they can have no way of explaining what's going on uh, back, you know? So it's a bizarre thing to think about for 80 years. Uh, that's what's going on. Even when they're talking Latin, even their own people don't even understand what's going on, right? So very mysterious. You have to be there Sunday, but nobody knows what's going on. Right? <laughs> but you better show up, you know? So, yeah. Um, you know, well, at Snooki, they, uh, on Sunday, or when they have a, a big celebration, they, um, they uh, have a possession, and then they shoot the gun, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I found out that uh, when the you know when when the Spaniards first came and they were forcing the people to go to church, uh, they would shoot them if they didn't go to church. And that's why. And, and today, uh, the Provo people are still celebrating with a shooting a gun. Mm -hmm. And what is that about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's crazy, all these things keep going through time. Yeah. You mentioned at the beginning something about Inquisition. Uh, so what were you referring to? Was there a setup of Inquisition here? Yeah, they had a, a, a full-blown representative of the Inquisition uh, located here in New Mexico. Uh, and, uh, and located in public communities itself. Uh, and so the representative of the Inquisition would be stationed at a Pueblo uh, mission, right? Now, um, based uh, on uh, church policy at the time, um, you couldn't, you couldn't, the Inquisition couldn't persecute um, Pueblo people necessarily directly because their mission was to seek out heretics and to seek out uh, um, other uh, uh, Jews. They were especially uh, stoked about looking for, for anybody who was Jewish, right? Um, but because um, Pueblo people were conversos, uh, and if you weren't a converso, there's, you couldn't be a heretic unless you already uh, had taken the first step, right? So a lot of times they're persecuting Spanish people for being Jewish or uh, people who started to act Jewish or people that seem sort of sketchy or uh, or persecuting the governor because he wasn't listening to the church, you know, back and forth like that, right? Um, and however, because they're stationed in the polo itself, you have these, basically they're like Catholic lawyers, you know, who are um, specialists in, in the canon and uh, understand all of the uh, papal bulls and everything like that, right? Uh, that policy makers, pretty high up level people who are right there in the Pueblos. Uh, and, and had some sort of influence in the way that religion was 
these are pretty hardline individuals. You know, their 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 job, if they were in Spain, was to creatively kill Jewish people, right? or to find people that look like a witch, you know, uh, and burn them, right? Um, and so they're right here in the middle of uh, Pueblo country. In fact, the first church doors before we burnt it down at Santa Clara, big, nice wooden doors. They were carved with the coat of arms of the Spanish Inquisition on the door of the church at Santa Clara Pueblo, right? Um, and so that does give some hint of the, the influence. Yeah. So, yes, now I'll get to you. When the reconquest happened is, uh, for the Pueblo people, is that when uh, they were issued the canes that many of the governors still carried on today, or is that with uh, more of a different government? The canes come in before the revolt. Um, so right from the beginning, the in Spanish they say vara is a cane. Um, and so Spanish officials in Spain, in any city, in, in Mexico, if you were in charge of something, you got a cane. So uh, in the United States, it seems unusual because it's the United States. Canes actually are common all throughout Sp wherever the Spanish went, you know. Um, and so they would, uh, whoever had the cane, the cane served several purposes, and uh, vara is a form of measurement. They actually used to use it to measure out distances and measure out tribute. Uh, they used to use it as punishment uh, in Spanish towns and everything like that. Um, and some of those are still practiced today. Um, you, you hear about people kneeling on the cane, you know, as punishment. Uh, for misbehavior, or whatever the case might be. Um, and so the canes go, you know, and then of course, um, canes, if we think about sticks uh, uh, and uh, what they symbolize in terms of going for before the Spanish, not to go into anything too, too uh, sensitive, they're older than the Spanish too. So there's the canes the Spanish brought, but there's things that are older than that too that come from before. So, so I think a lot of the ideas connected with the canes actually are also indigenous ideas about what does that mean and stuff like that, you know? But the Spanish also were very deliberate. They have a nice stamp of the king of Spain, you know, it's a lot of the ones in, in Spain and Mexico. So that you have a stick with a silver top on there that actually has the king's coat of arms showing you are direct vassal of the king of Spain, right? People better listen to you, right? And so the Spanish were, were, were very much about that. However, part of the reason why they would issue new kings a lot as well is the old king dies, get new king, right? The old coat of arms don't count anymore, right? So now you need to make a new king, new coat of arms, issue that one with the new king signature on there. So you could, you could acquire a stack of these over time, right? But I don't think the Spanish intended them to be used that way. They, they thought of them as symbols, as, as vassals of the king, right? Um, and so those are something that, if, I don't know if any of the kings from before the Polo Revolt survived. I don't know that. Um, perhaps some did, perhaps they didn't. Who knows what happened to those kings, right? Uh, but considering the destruction of churches and stuff like that, I, I would guess most of them got destroyed on It'd be amazing to think some made it, but maybe they did. Most of the canes that are in all the polls today come from after that time. Yeah. So, now, the question back there. I just want to say thank you for your talk tonight because I learned a lot, and congratulations for going to, uh, even with all the technical difficulties. It's still very funny and very good, a lot of knowledge. So thank you for very early on they say well nobody knows and they say well there's so many stories and uh the spaniards say one thing and what else is another and uh let's just stop talking about it because nobody knows and so my question is uh, in studying right now like you do uh do you feel that's true or is that just a uh, gaslighting because people are just kind of putting it off because it's an uncomfortable topic is it true that there is a lack of literature on this topic and also 
the last part is, is your talk available for sharing with other people that couldn't make it tonight? And then if not, if you come talk to other places. <laughs> I, 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 I don't, I just have a PowerPoint. This is actually for my polio history class that when I talk about polio involvement, this is my PowerPoint for class. Um, so I can, I can share that or I can come in. Most of it is just a bunch of pictures. Um, so uh, that you can. I disagree. <laughs> we missed half your picture, I think, more than that. It's mostly your personality. <laughs> so I'm happy to come and talk more. I think there's a lot of uh, stuff that's written on this topic. We you gonna, you have a video? Oh, so you could, <clears throat> you could go to their archives, I guess. Yes. Uh, I mean, in terms of books, is it, is it really true that there is not a lot written and there's not a lot of solutions? You must have read everything that's out there. There, there's conflicts between different authors who have different perspectives and come from different schools of historiography um, and, and are arguing for different cases. Uh, we have, uh, for example, Borderlands, the old original Borderlands historiography. Uh, they were very much uh, um, in line with trying to crush, there was this black legend created uh, by the English and perpetuated by the Americans about the Spanish or inherently cruel, evil people. Um, and so the uh, Borderlands historiography was a lot focused on trying to counter that, that story and say, well, they weren't that bad. In fact, they did lots of cool things, right? Um, and so when they came to things like Polo Revolt, they're like, uh, they told the story in a very borderlands kind of way, right? And then we have uh, uh, archaeologists like Robert Purcell and Woody Aguilar who are adding to that story. Uh, Liebman, um, all these people who are adding to the story in, from their very specific perspectives. So the story has been written a lot uh, about quite a few times. There's quite a few books about the Polar Revolt. You go out there and try to find books on the Tarahumara Revolt that's going on same time or the Chichimeca revolts, or the Mishtek uh, uh, revolts, right? Or the Kashkanis that revolted, right? All these people are revolting same time, and um, you might find books in Spanish, not even in, in English you won't find it, or you might not find anything at all, right? So in comparison, in comparison the Polar Revolt is actually fairly well written about, and there is um, lots of discussion back and forth, right? Um, and so I think that's, that's um, that's part of it as well. I'm sorry if there was another section I didn't, didn't uh, remember your question. I don't know who raised the hand first. Okay, so I'm, I'm Santa Clara, mm -hmm. but I'm also Hopi from Oregon. My mm -hmm. dad is from Oregon. And there is a Catholic mission that is in ruins. It was destroyed. The priest that was stationed there was killed um, during that whole time of conflict. Um, probably about the same time as the Amatogi village was destroyed. Um, and it kind of goes back to what you're saying. On our own native perspective of the revolt, what I was taught, like from the Hopi perspective of this, is that the Hopi were a peaceful people that didn't believe in bloodshed, didn't believe in war. So a lot of our perspective isn't told. Mm -hmm. because it's like a taboo to, to speak yeah. about these things mm -hmm. and we don't glorify war we don't glorify those killings because it's not who we were mm -hmm. it's not when we came from these other worlds that we descend you know ascended from we weren't those kind of people mm -hmm. and so you know to to find a Hopi perspective you're not really going to find one, and people don't really talk about it. Even coming forward into modern wars, Vietnam, um, World War II, the code talkers, there's code talkers from Hopi. Um, you know, my grandfather had a Purple Heart from the Korean War. He never talked about it because that's, it was something he had to do to serve his country, but it was something that went against his beliefs as a Hopi person. Um, and so I kind of listening to what some of these other perspectives are and the questions that you're being asked, um, you know, it's, it's, we talk about it, 
um, it's not to be gaslighted in a way because we are who we are because of the revolt and what this other gentleman had to say in preserving our traditions, our culture, our language, our dances, um, all of those things, we can't forget. Mm -hmm. Because by forgetting, then we start to lose at the same time. Our future generations, like we're saying, teaching our children, our culture, our languages, um, the dances. I had an experience maybe 10, 15 years ago when I was dancing and there were some younger children there, young teenagers. They didn't know why we were dancing. They were talking amongst themselves and I was just listening. And it was sad because they didn't know what these songs represented, what these dances represented. Why, why do we wear these certain things? But we can't, as a Native people, can't forget our past, because then we forget our future. And so that's kind of just in listening to these different questions and then your perspective and your teachings, you know, just, I learned a lot this evening, and, you know, you know, uh, you know what, you, what, what I learned this evening. Yeah, thank you for sharing uh, that perspective as well, because it's important, all the different perspectives that are included in there. It makes it complicated, you know, mm -hmm. about how we talk about something, why we choose to talk about something, why we choose not to talk about something, you know. And what's more important, uh, practicing those things that made us who we are, or, you know, talking about these other things, but we still have these things, you know. Uh, perhaps, as uh, sometimes I think, uh, like uh, Matt, Matt Gary said, uh, the, the Spanish coming in, the revolt, the reconquest, all of that was very, very overt threat to our way of life, right? It was a clear and present threat to our way of life. TV doesn't have a machine gun pointed at you. TV and cell phones don't uh, shock you every time you touch it, you know? Uh, um, computers don't whip you if you don't log in every day. You know, um, so they present a, a danger to us that doesn't look dangerous at all, right? It's a danger that we don't even see coming. Perhaps these things are the most dangerous thing that Polo people have ever faced, perhaps. Um, and even far more dangerous than, uh, um, than uh, the Spanish were, you know? Because the Spanish came like, I have this sharp thing and I will put it in you, you know? That's something you can see. You're like, oh yeah, that's a bad guy, you know? Um, the TV doesn't do that to you, a cell phone doesn't do that to you, uh, and as a result, it's perhaps far more dangerous uh, than some of these things, you know? And so it becomes even more important to remember why we do what we do, uh, and to look out for what are those things that continue to threaten our way of life, uh, to continue to threaten, perhaps even at a more higher level, a more alarming level than even the Spanish could do, you know? I think in the, just a few years, uh, some of these things uh, uh, are proving to be far more dangerous, you know. The Spanish were working hard for 80 years and they couldn't do what a cell phone could do, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or a computer, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's something to think about. Yes, sir. So um, <clears throat> I read a couple books uh, mentioning this guy, Esteban, it was a Moor, that had something to do with helping Pope plan in Taos. Do you know anything about that? Uh, well, Estabanico is from an earlier time, um, and so I think perhaps the person you're thinking about is Naranjo, Domingo Naranjo's dad, um, who, um, who by one account um, was actually a, a, a African, a Moorish man who married a uh, Nawa woman came up here as part of uh, uh, Onyate's group, mm. somehow ended up at Santa Clara and living there and being Santa Clara, apparently, had kids there who then became all the Naranjos in Northern New Mexico. So everybody, anybody who's a Naranjo comes from that dude, right? And they all come from Santa Clara uh, through this African guy 
and his Nawal wife, right? Uh, and so at one point, all the Naranjos got in a fight with each other. One of the Naranjos was, at Santa Clara was like, oh, you know what, I'm not Indian anymore. In fact, I'm Spanish. So he moved down up the river and he became Spanish. Just like that, he's like, I'm not Indian anymore, I'm Spanish. <laughs> and that's are all the Spanish Naranjos. Those are all the ones in Española, Hernandez, Coyote, or wherever you find a Naranjo, it came from that dude who's like, I'm not Indian anymore. Right? Uh, and so those are all the Naranjos, they all come from that group there. So um, I think that might be the one you're talking about who was uh, uh, perhaps enslaved, perhaps then became free, and then uh, he married in Mexico, somehow becomes a Santa Clara person uh, through living there or whatever the case, has kids and then generations later, you know, then he's, uh, then he's, uh, that's the story. <laughs> there was somebody back there. Oh, over here. Yes, sir. Any ministry for Nambe Polo? Nambe Polo? Um, Definite participants in the revolt. That's probably, I mean, I, I, I know of that internal conflicts, stories about internal conflicts at Nambay and maybe uh, uh, the early 1800s uh, or maybe late 1700s where a lot of the people were fighting and perhaps uh, a lot of the people left from there. Um, but uh, Nambe is kind of lump, lumped in with the Kowaki, Kujemuge, uh, Kuyamange, um, as participating in things as, as a group, you know, as being closely related to each other and doing things together. Uh, I, a lot of times people talk about dialects of uh, Tewa. Um, there's always talk about Southern Tewa, spoken by the Tanos in the south and northern Tewa, which is all the villages up here besides Santa Clara. Um, and that um, some, some linguists, and of course some Santa Clara people as well say that the dialect that we speak at Santa Clara represents the Tano dialect, it's more closely related with the Tano dialect. Um, so that's interesting. Probably people will argue about that or whatever. But Santa Clara definitely speaks a, a very distinctive dialect, but also uh, probably this um, valley here, Nambe, uh, Polo, and potentially Powaki longer ago in Kujemuge had a middle Tewa dialect as well. That was uh, uh, quite a bit distinctive from even what's called Northern Tewa. Uh, so it'd be like um, middle, southern, and northern Tewa or whatever. So those are things that just popped to my head in terms of I don't have any specific information about Polar Revolt, but those are things. Yeah, yeah. And they can understand us. You can understand them. Yeah. Not because of our Spanish, you know, word in it. It's hard for them to understand us. Yeah. You really have to adjust your ear to figure out. Yeah. And they come fast. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the stories I've heard about planning for the revolt as far as language, that the Spanish were here and the uh, Pueblo people were forced to learn the Franco lingua for the, for the church. And in order for the Tiwa and the Kiris and the Tewa to communicate, that they communicated with that language. And that's how the Pueblo revolt. <laughs> Yeah. Made it happen by teaching the language. Well, one of the interesting to plan the revolt. Wow. Yeah. It's one of the interesting sort of notes is that a lot of the leaders of the Polar Revolt were uh, uh, what the Spanish term mestizos. So they were part from that Pueblo and part Spanish, mm -hmm. right? And so they actually could, most of those leaders could speak Spanish because they were actually part Spanish. And so that was part of, the interesting part of the leaders, most, many of the leaders, an unusual number of the leaders, were mestizos from the various pueblos, right? And so uh, they could certainly talk Spanish because one of their parents, a lot of times, were Spanish and they connected with that in some cases. So, yeah, that's a 
that's a good point. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs>